to the Grow with Sophia series. This is episode seven, which I can't believe. And it's called Diagnosis Downfall. This episode's a little bit different for me in the past, going through memories. I have a huge smile on my face and it just floods in really happy memories. But this episode is going to condense several years together. Um, for several reasons, it's a difficult, Thing for me to see um, Sophia get diagnosed with these life-limiting illnesses and at the time I employed the use of toxic positivity as my way to survive and to get through and to get out of bed every day and it's not necessarily bad positivity is a good thing but what I did was deny all of the sad emotions the fear the pain and I don't regret it because I had to continue to be a mom. I had to be strong for Sophia going through these surgeries or um, different tests that she had to experience. And so I did what I had to do. I probably didn't unleash those repressed emotions until 2016 when I became a public advocate. And I'll save that all for another episode down the road. It's hard to revisit these memories that a lot of them I've locked out. But something that I did realize while revisiting some of these repressed memories is that it also repressed some of the good memories during this time, and there were so many of them. I am in awe of how Sophia handled all of these new complications arising, and proud of the way Mark and I handled it because we just accepted her abilities and we accepted the fact that she was regressing and we continued to adapt to her and adapted things to her to make life work for us and we still went on trips and laughed and had a lot of fun and managed to balance everything during this time so I'm glad that having to revisit sad emotions I'm glad that it brought up these good memories as well because I didn't realize that I had forgotten them because they were in the same time frame. So I will start this episode answering the most commonly asked question and that is what is Sophia's diagnosis? But first I want to mention that when she was born these conditions did not present themselves and so she had no diagnosis until she was three years old. And none of these conditions were caused by anything other than a spontaneous genetic change. And they were not hereditary. Then the first diagnosis she received was the diagnosis of an immune deficiency. It was rare and didn't have a name because it, uh, she didn't have any B cells and it affected other parts of her immune system. And then soon after we realized that she was having seizures and at five years old we had a name for why her skills were regressing and that was Rett syndrome and basically Rett syndrome doesn't typically begin to present itself until two years old and slowly your child loses the skills that they gained they're they're developing typically and then all of a sudden that changes and their ability to use their hands and for Sophia, she started to lose the ability to hold her head up. It caused seizures, tremors. It affects the autonomic system, which is your body that automatically breathes. It automatically swallows. Your heart automatically beats. And Rett syndrome can cause your body to forget that. And so there, will, there would be breathless moments or swallowing difficulty, which is why she had to get her feeding tube put back in. And she also was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. But later on, we had a scientist who researched her DNA and tissue. And her, along with maybe a dozen others, has an immune deficiency that is what caused her facial differences, hand-foot differences, and some other things. Though I have made the choice not to share the name of that syndrome because there were things about Sophia that were very personal that I chose not to share. And now that this syndrome is a published syndrome, those details are out there. And 
I think those are too private to share, so I will keep that to ourselves. But it is the syndrome that caused her immune deficiency, lack of B cells, and caused the differences to her face, hands, and feet. There are other cases like her, those so Sophia's had the most prominent changes um, in appearance. I remember the first time Mark went out of town and I had Alex in my arms and I had Sophia in my arms and you will see in many pictures I'm holding both of them for years and years. And um, it was one night I was sitting there by myself and both Sophia and Alex started crying at the same time and I remember feeling helpless and I would have to take turns with who I could help and assist and this was kind of the beginning of the regression stage for Sophia and it was all a part of Rett syndrome which we didn't know about until she was five years old. So at two she, she began having moments of regression but she still was doing great and was healthy. And I remember taking her to an appointment and someone had mentioned this North Carolina program for children with disabilities that um, gave Sophia extra assistance. And basically Sophia had great private insurance, but there was so much that they don't cover. And um, this program covered the costs that our private insurance wouldn't and also services that it wouldn't like um, medical equipment, wheelchairs, different things like that, bath chairs. Say hi, Papa. Say hi, Papa. No, he's not here. <laughs> hey. hey. The most important part of this program was that it provided in-home nursing assistance and it allowed us to set up our home in a medical type way so that Sophia could have everything she needed at home and get the care that she needed at home. And um, I remember when we signed up and Sophia was approved and um, we had the first nursing assistant scheduled to come out the next day and I remember that night just crying and crying because I felt like I had failed because I wasn't able to care for both of my children without help and then um, we met Ella and she changed our lives uh, for the better. assistant that was with us and she was there till the very end and when I say the end I mean the moment that Sophia was no longer with us and her presence was valued and appreciated and needed. She changed our family and um, allowed us to have typical moments and to be able to function as a family together and Ella was just the most amazing person um, and throughout the years we had so many amazing women a part of our families and in our home and it just made a really huge difference in our lives and as Sophia was diagnosed with certain medical conditions like her immune deficiency you know taking her out wasn't possible without risking her life so we were able to do things and take her son out and take him to the park and you know, Sophia was being cared for and played with at home. We are forever grateful to Ella and just one of the most dependable, amazing, strong women that I've ever had the honor of being around. So I remember when I had Sophia, I would always ask doctors, like, how much time do I have with her? I wasn't sure if she would make it to her first birthday and when she finally did and met that milestone and then began to develop typically in her own way and was playing with toys and talking and able to eat on her own. We actually had her feeding tube removed. Um, she was just doing really well and her and her brother loved playing together. Anthony! Anthony! 
Are you saying Alex? Yeah. You got me. Alex. 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 What's Alex doing? <laughs> and Sophia turned three years old and she had a sweet little birthday celebration and we had no idea that this birthday would mark the last um, of her life without medical complications. and different medical issues every single year added on. It wasn't until she was three years old that she was diagnosed with her immune deficiency. And I remember she had fevers for five months long and I kept taking her to different specialists, doctor's appointments, tests, and that's when I realized I really have to become a forceful advocate for my daughter. And I said she needs to be in the hospital, she needs tests run, I can't keep waiting week to week for different specialists and this isn't typical for her to have fevers nonstop for this long. And so she had really great doctors and they admitted her to the hospital and began running tests. And I remember at one point saying to a doctor, hey, is it possible she has an immune deficiency? I had been searching and researching just to try to figure things out. And I said, that's highly unlikely, that's so rare. And I said, you know, I really think we should test anyway. Sophia is rare and um, they did. And it turns out she had an immune deficiency. It's just one of those memories and one of those moments that shifted me. And I said, you know, I, I have to be a bit more forceful and I have to advocate for my daughter. And from that point on, things kind of snowballed and we started to notice that when she would sit up, she would start to fall back. Uh, we noticed a regression in her ability to use her hands and play with things. And she began to drop her head occasionally. Hey, put it. Alex, hmm? say hi. I love you. <laughs> you laughing, Sophia? seizures and it turned out that she was having really severe seizures um, and while she slept they were happening constantly in her brain and that was a horrible thing to realize um, and that's really when the regression began and it was moment to moment what her abilities um, would do and what she could do and slowly over time she began to lose those abilities and I think by the time she was four, she had to have her feeding tube put back in because she was losing the ability to swallow properly. And it was really difficult to see. It was scary, but we continued to do therapies and we didn't want her to lose the skills that she had developed um, at the very least. And we thought, you know, it was still possible to continue the therapies to strengthen her, to strengthen her neck. We tried so hard and little did we know that um, it wasn't going to be possible because she had a condition that would slowly deteriorate all of her abilities that she had gained. 
when Sophia was four, she was having a lot of health issues and wasn't able to hold her food down. And you can see in the images how thin she was. And again, I had to advocate hard and push for her to be admitted into the hospital because we were going from specialist to specialist and within each appointment are weeks and my child was going through a lot and she was losing weight and she was struggling. She also had several surgeries during this time to help relieve her pain. And as I've mentioned before, the only surgeries that she would have were to relieve pain and to make her function better so that life could be more comfortable for her. And it was a difficult time to watch her go through that. But it was very important to me to accept her as she was and so I pushed away any fears or sadness that I had that she was changing and needing more help and in the good moments we had fun and continued to do the things that we loved like dance parties and celebrations and spend time with family and she continued to be joyful and continued to laugh and have fun and cuddle and be sweet. And she was handling what was happening to her, although it was frustrating and scary for her. Um, she would live in the moment. Many of those years just felt like I was trying to survive and be the strongest that I could be. And when you are the main caregiver, you push your emotions aside to help your child. As times got difficult and time went on, we realized that we were likely gonna lose her. She had the immune deficiency, which was life limiting. And then when she was five years old, she was diagnosed with Rett syndrome, which is what was happening all along, which is what caused the regression of her skills. And so a lot of things came together when we received the Rett syndrome diagnosis. Um, but it was really hard to receive that diagnosis because with that comes the knowledge that these children can pass away and they are at a higher risk for sudden death, not only because the autonomic system can dysfunction, but because of seizures. And so she had many things that could put her life at risk and that was a difficult thing to accept but we did and you try to live in the moment but it's always always on your mind and you begin to live in a state of hyper vigilance and fight or flight listening for every little sound and watching everything so there was a lot of grief involved in receiving life limiting diagnosis it was such a an opposite feeling at times. We're dealing with so much uh, with Sophia and fear and pain and sadness and uh, then we had this little light just running around and being sweet and silly so it was this wonderful balance to to have that and put life in perspective and remind you that despite what's going on you have to continue to live and move forward and he brought so much joy to Sophia and she would just laugh at him and they would have fun together and even though her skills had decreased it didn't matter they learned to play with each other in whatever ways they could oh, no. say hi say hi to the camera Sophia, get kids. Oh, sweet. Okay, let's go forward. But when we decided we wanted to have Alex, Sophie was doing really well, and we just thought her challenges would be physical ones, and so we wanted her to have a brother, but. When we thought about having another child, it was a very different thought process because 
at that point I knew at some point I am going to lose my dog and I don't want Alex to be alone and not have a sister or a brother and so we decided to expand our family and we had Lila and completed our family and it brought a lot of joy to our family and as promised and demanded, Lila will be born in the next episode and that will be hers to share. Blow daddy a kiss. Oh, good.